What is a moon? Technically, a moon is a natural satellite orbiting around a larger object, or a planet. Now, in our case, Earth only has one moon, being the moon. That's where the name moon came from. However, if we look at larger objects like Jupiter and Saturn, they have many moons, most of which are rather large and even larger than our own moon. But something that's rather strange is how large our moon is. It's the fifth largest moon in the entire solar system, and yet Earth is a rather small planet compared to these gas giants. So where did our moon come from? Let's talk about that. Where did the moon come from? In order to address this question, let's first go back in time to the year 1845 to Emma and Charles Darwin. Yes, you heard that correct. Charles Darwin, the guy that came up with the theory of evolution and natural selection. But he's not our main character in this story, but rather their son, George Darwin. You see, George Darwin wasn't as focused on biology as he was interested in mathematics and astronomy. In fact, a lot of his research or focus in life was towards the motion of objects in the night sky, such as planets, tidal effects, astronomy in general, and one brief observation regarding the formation of the moon. You see, George Darwin was able to calculate that the moon is actually slowly drifting away from Earth, and therefore he believed that at one point in time in the past, the Earth and the moon must have once been a single object. Now, with more recent observations after the space race, we've been able to decide that the moon is actually drifting away from Earth at around 4 centimeters per year, which might sound like a lot, but remember, we're talking about astronomical terms here. So it's not that far, but it still is moving away from us. So what was George Darwin's conclusion about this object moving away? Originally, he thought at one point in time, the Earth and the Moon were one object. And when the Earth was still a molten rock or liquid form, it was spinning so fast that some of Earth's matter was accreted into outer space. And over time, this built up to form the Moon. So about four and a half billion years ago, the Moon was slowly building up by accreted material coming off of the Earth. And eventually it got larger and larger and larger and further away enough from the Earth to form what we see now here today. What's really interesting about George Darwin's observations is that he predicted this 70 years before astronauts would land on the surface of the moon, before the turn of the 20th century. So was he right? Do scientists believe in his hypothesis? And it turns out that a majority of scientists believe in something else. A hypothesis that came about in the mid-1940s by a professor at Harvard. This professor's name was Reginald Daly, and Daly had more of the observation or perspective from a geologist. He understood some of the impact craters that existed on the moon and thought maybe the moon's formation or where it came from was an impact rather than just material being flung out into space. So he believed or came up with the hypothesis that maybe the moon formed when two planet-sized objects hit one another in the early stages of the solar system. Now that's truly fascinating. And at the time, it didn't gain a lot of attention because it seemed rather abstract, but it's also because at the time he said, we don't know enough information. He wrote this paper providing this new hypothesis, but in his conclusion he said, at this point in time, in the mid-1940s, we don't understand enough about the moon or have the science to back it up. So we need to learn more about the formation of the solar system before we can address this question. And fortunately, we've been able to learn a lot over the past 70 years. We've sent people to the surface of the moon, sent many missions to explore various objects throughout our solar system. So has it helped his hypothesis or hurt it? Let's take a look. It turns out that a lot of the scientific observations made over the past 70 years lean towards Daly's hypothesis, being that there was a giant impact between two planet-sized objects. Now, this hypothesis is currently given the name Giant Impact Hypothesis, so it's pretty easy to understand by just hearing the name. But let me go a little bit more in detail in terms of what scientists believe is what could have happened. They think that around four and a half billion years ago, 
Earth was approximately the size it is now, maybe a little bit smaller. But there might have been another planet around or nearby Earth, commonly given the name Theia. Now, scientists believe that Theia could have been potentially as large as the planet Mars, and again, four and a half billion years ago, collided with Earth, therefore leaving a large cloud of debris around the system, which eventually cooled down and formed the moon. And then much later, Earth would have cooled down and formed, well, Earth as we know it today. Now, scientists also believe that Earth could have been hit by a lot of planet-sized objects, which is what allowed it to be as large as it is today. It's important to note that a lot of these observations or theories are being built off of computer simulated models. So seeing what types of impacts of what angles and what speeds give us solutions that look similar to what we have here in the Earth-Moon system. What is really fascinating about understanding the formation of the Moon is that there are a lot of different paths that could lead us to what we have today, being the Earth-Moon system. So that means that researchers notice different things that arise when they are doing these analysis or these simulations. For example, it's noted that there's a lot of cases where rather than creating one moon, there are two smaller moons that form, which eventually impact each other. So it's fascinating to think that at one point in time in our history, we could have potentially had two moons. Now I say our history as Earth's history, not human history, because this still would have been billions of years ago. In addition, an impact between Earth and Theia would make Earth spin incredibly fast. Therefore, a day on Earth would only be 5 hours rather than 24 hours. And that essentially means that the Earth has been slowing down. And scientists basically think that when dinosaurs roamed the Earth, the length of a day on Earth was only 23 hours. So if you were to live for another 100 million years or so, maybe you would have a little bit more time of the day to get some stuff done. The giant impact hypothesis is favored by most scientists. However, there are still some other hypotheses. These being that the moon was captured when it flew by too close to the Earth, and the other one being that nuclear explosions that occurred in the early stages of Earth's formation ejected material that again formed the moon. But yet again, the giant impact hypothesis is favored by most scientists. So there's a lot of scientific explanation that goes towards the giant impact hypothesis and not towards some of these other hypotheses. Now you might have noticed in this video I've talked about a few things. Hypotheses, observations, simulations, some math, but for the most part I've missed one key idea. And this being the fact that NASA sent astronauts to the surface of the moon to collect moon rocks and bring them back to Earth. Why haven't I talked about the moon rocks yet? And that's because over the last 30 years, scientists not only in the United States, but all across the globe have noticed something very interesting about these moon rocks. And that has to do with their oxygen isotope levels. But what is an isotope level? What does that even mean? Let me describe that first and then we can go back to what discoveries have been made. An isotope is essentially a fancy name for a rarer kind of element. So for example, any given element has a certain number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And an isotope is just taking an element or an atom and having one too many neutrons or two too many neutrons. So for example, a normal oxygen atom has eight protons and eight neutrons. But let's say one had eight protons and nine neutrons. Now it's an isotope. That's the only thing that makes it an isotope. And yes, isotopes do refer to radioactive elements, but that's usually on the higher scale of things for things such as uranium. But we're not gonna talk about that. We just need to know that an isotope is kind of like a rarer kind of element. But what's important about this is if you took a million oxygen atoms, you can count or figure out how many of them are isotopes. And that's what's really unique because Anywhere we've gone in the solar system, we're able to find oxygen atoms within molecules or other types of structures that we're able to find on these surfaces. For example, asteroids, comets, or other planets such as Mars. And whenever we do this, we can determine how much of these oxygen atoms are actually isotopes. So we can figure out out of how many million oxygen atoms we look at, how many of them are isotopes, which has led to us understanding where we are in the solar system. Interestingly enough, 
Basically, every object or every celestial object we've visited has had a different oxygen isotope level, except for one. It turns out that the isotope or the oxygen isotope levels on Earth and the Moon are nearly identical. And I say nearly identical because a recent study over the past five years has showed that technically there's a difference, but it's really, really close, much closer than anywhere else we've been in the solar system. Meaning that if the Earth and the Moon are made up of the same stuff, then we must have been one at one point in history. So does that mean that George Darwin was right? Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, if you took a giant planet and hit it with another planet, they're obviously going to combine and basically form one object. But other studies have shown that even if you took two planets in the early stages of the solar system that formed in two different parts of the solar system, if they hit each other, there would be less than a 1% chance that the isotope levels would be as similar as we see today. So again, is there an issue here? And the main idea is that these giant impact hypotheses weren't fully understood until recent years, where simulations show that potentially multiple impacts with large planet-sized objects, or rather this mixture, is actually happening a lot more than we thought in the past, creating large clouds of debris rather than smaller rings that were thought in the last couple decades. So it's fascinating to see how these observations can actually influence what is understood in these simulations. Because yet again, it's not easy to simulate these kind of impacts. Now there are actually other compositional questions that exist such as iron levels, titanium, or the types of titanium, as well as just the kind of water that exists on the moon. These things don't correlate as much as if the giant impact hypothesis is actually correct. But again, there's still a lot that needs to be understood in terms of the early stages of the solar system to figure out how exactly our moon formed. But even though these things don't align as nicely as we'd like them to, it turns out that the giant impact hypothesis is still mainly favored because that mostly means that maybe these two things did hit each other, but we don't understand as humans what that ultimately means. We just need to understand the system as a whole better to figure out what's going on. And that's the same conclusion that Daly made in his hypothesis nearly 70 years ago. There's also another major question, and this has to do with not Earth, but Venus. You see, Venus is a little bit smaller than Earth, but it's nearly the same size. And if Earth was hit by multiple planet-sized objects in its history, then the odds are that Venus would have as well, which means that it should also have a rather large moon, but Venus doesn't have any moons. So does that mean we still don't understand what's going on? So how can we pull all this information together? It's fascinating to say that Earth was once hit by a planet the size of Mars in our history and that created the moon. That's a really exciting thing to say and really interesting to try and visualize. But what I personally find more fascinating is that our celestial neighbor, essentially the closest thing that we have to Earth, we still know very little about. We don't know how many times Earth was hit by massive objects in its history. We don't know why our isotopes match the moon so much. We could have even had multiple moons in our history and we would have no idea. All these hypotheses lead to a better understanding of how everything works in the solar system and yet there's still a lot that we don't understand. So maybe in our next lifetime we'll have a lot of new observations regarding the formation of the moon or the formation of anything in our solar system. And who knows, maybe you'll be the one that ends up figuring it out. So with that being said, how do you think our moon formed? Do you think it was the giant impact hypothesis? It could have been a captured moon from somewhere else, nuclear explosions, or maybe again, George Darwin was right. But with that being said, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.